Good morning, everyone. As many in our congregation already know, this year we're celebrating through a special religion and philosophy lecture series, the 150th birth anniversary of Swami Abedananda, a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna and the third spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society of New York. He was here from 1897 to 1921. <clears throat> Swami Bhaidananda came to take charge of the Vedanta Society of New York at the request of Swami Vivekananda, and during his tenure gave a well-received series of lectures, traveling extensively throughout the United States, Alaska, and Mexico, and was acclaimed as a great exponent and writer of Vedanta and Hindu thought and culture. His complete works span 11 volumes. We are delighted and honored that as the third speaker in this series, Professor John Hawley, Claire Tao Professor of Religion at Barnard University, has consented to talk to us today on the subject of bhakti in historical perspective. Professor Hawley <coughs> excuse me, joined Barnard's faculty in 1986. His research is focused on the religious life of North India and on the literature it has spawned in the course of the last 500 years. He is the author or editor of 20 books, many on Hinduism and the religions of India. One of the most recent of these, A Storm of Songs, India and the Idea of the Bhakti Movement in 2017, earned Professor Hawley the Ananda Kentish Kumaswari Book Prize, awarded by the South Asian Council of the Association for Asian Studies in Toronto. A second recent book, Schur's Ocean, Poems from the Early Tradition, co-authored with Kenneth Bryant, is one of the inaugural volumes in the Murti Classical Library of India. Professor Hawley has served as director of Columbia University's South Asia Institute and has received multiple awards from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Smithsonian, and the American Institute of Indian Studies. He has also been a Guggenheim Fellow and was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2016-17, he was a Fulbright Nehru Fellow principally resident in Vrindavan. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome this morning to Professor Hoy. It's a huge privilege to be back. It's been far too many years. Thank goodness, Bill, that you're still here. At least there's that and uh, some other really old friends and uh, a number of new friends. And Peter, thank you so much for guiding me down the street as I stumbled out of the subway. I am not a morning person. I am not a morning person. I believe that this is morning, but it's only a belief on my part. So I warn you, uh, don't trust anything that may happen in the next several minutes. It's coming from a person whom I do not know myself. Let me also say that uh, just in the course of talking with Swamiji, um, it's made me think about religion in New York once again. Uh, I come from the Midwest, basically. We did travel to the East in the course of my childhood, but it's a Midwest family. And uh, when we first came to New York, my wife and I, I had been here as a student, but we came back from the West Coast, actually. I thought, how can I do this? Uh, you know, all these buildings around, people living on top of each other, like some strange species that cannot exist elsewhere in the world, or maybe Calcutta. But, you know, how can people do it? And aren't you sort of just leaving behind the natural resources of the world for physical and spiritual flourishing by coming to live in New York? And I think people sometimes do feel this. You know, New York has a reputation for being a godless city. We have a suburb out there on Long Island that's called Babylon, but we are the true Babylon. And you know, New York. But if you look between the cracks and if you think about the history of this city, as we were this morning, uh, a, a remarkable amount has happened in this city in particular and in other cities, which relate to the cosmopolitan religious life of the species, of us as human beings. It's no accident, I think, 
that uh, many of Swami Vivekananda's early discussions in America happened here in New York. Yes, he was on stage in, in, at the parliament in Chicago, and yes, my daughter is a graduate student at the University of Chicago, you know, right near where he was. Yes, 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 Chicago. But then the people who were most interested in, uh, in talking with him were, um, were East Coasters and West Coasters and people living here in New York. It's a great honor to be sort of back in the midst of that. And of course, it's not just the Vedanta Society that represents that cosmopolitan engagement with a kind of religiosity that might not have been familiar to many Americans at that time. But there are many other expressions of religious life in New York that answer to that same um, desire to make sense of the world in uh, whatever new terms it was revealing itself and to make sense of the sort of complexity of the human species in the course of doing so. Hence, it's a great honor to be here. I, um, I would like to talk about bhakti this morning, and I don't have much sense, actually, of the ways in which, the extent to which, the idea or the reality of bhakti actually matters to people like yourselves who might find yourselves here on a Sunday morning. So I look forward to learning that in the course of uh, a conversation that will follow. Certainly bhakti has mattered to me, not just because of uh, uh, decades of sort of being interested in it as it manifests itself in India, but also because of my Christian past. It is, after all, a bhakti past. <laughs> This is the religion, the religion that I come from. This is the religion that I know. The singing of hymns, the greeting of people on a Sunday morning and at other times, a certain devotion to um, um, social betterment in the society and trying to reach beyond actually the sort of institutional divides or institutional scaffolding of religious life. All of those things are bhakti things and they're a part of my Christian uh, background just as they are the part of the backgrounds of most Indians with whom I've had a chance to talk, whether here or there, over the years. So bhakti matters to me. But I'm also, as it turns out, an historian. And I wonder how many of you turn out to be historians as well. If I were in church this morning at this hour, which I would not be because I'm, a morn I'm not a morning person. <laughs> no, I would be... I would be looking around to see who has church in the afternoon, and there are such places. I'm often at St. John's for, the, for even song, or perhaps on a good day, because music matters, down at St. Peter's, not so far from here, where they do Bach cantatas every Sunday at five. But never mind, if I were in church, take that hypothetical moment, if I were in church at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, it would be the case that one would have a reading from the Hebrew Bible known as the Old Testament in Christian circles, and then there would be a reading from the letter of, some letter of Paul to the fledgling Christian community, and then there would be a reading from the Gospel, from one of the four Gospels in which the life story of Jesus is told. And then there would be a sermon of some kind, if you're in the Episcopal Church, it's mercifully brief, but it can be mercifully brutal as well. <laughs> Uh, often good, but not always good. That's all right. We are all, all of us sort of sometimes good and sometimes not so good. Um, if the Gospel of John is being read, if the Gospel of John is being read, by contrast to the other three, I know I'm in for trouble because it is the position of the Gospel of John that, I mean, one feels as one hears the Gospel of John, and it, well, let me just start the sentence again. You may well know John stands at a distance from what are called the synoptic gospels. It's very different from Mark, Matthew, and Luke. The Jesus whom we meet there is distinctively different. And to take a recent holiday, if one were to think of uh, the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples, which of course is celebrated as the Eucharist, if you're an Episcopalian, uh, every Sunday, um, and more often, the way in which that event is reported in the Gospel of John is very different from the way in which it's reported in the Synoptic Gospels. I'll spare you the details, but since I'm seeing Peter's face there, let me say that Rachel and I have a long-standing, uh, sorry, Peter's sister is Rachel McDermott, my dear, beloved colleague upon whom I rely in all things at Barnard. Um, for, for both Rachel and me, 
that uh, that moment that comes on Maundy Thursday, the Thursday before Good Friday and Easter, is the most crucial day of the Christian calendar. And Rachel especially looks forward to it because of the way in which it's celebrated in the Episcopal Church, which is that at evening, there is a reenactment of Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet as he welcomed them into his midst. That event is not reported in any of the synoptic gospels, and I believe it did not happen in history. Similarly, Jesus is constantly saying in the Gospel of John, at the end of the Gospel, he reports on his conversations with the Father. He's very confident of his relationship with the Father and what's going to happen as he's absented from his followers. And he speaks very confidently about the fa what the Father's doing, how the Father has sent him, and so forth. It's not historical. When he says, in the course of a conversation, apropos of the resurrection of Lazarus, of oh, the, the birth, the death of Lazarus, about to be resurrection, that I am the resurrection and the life. Those are words we do not read in any of the other Gospels, and I do not believe that he said them. So when someone preaches on the Gospel of John without taking into account the fact that the Jesus who is being vocalized there is actually the Jesus of the church's memory and wish, when someone misses that step, I feel terrible. I know that I'm not making contact, direct contact as I would like to make, with the Jesus of history. It's very hard, of course, to get to the Jesus of history, but we, it's impossible, actually. But the other Gospels give us a much more vivid sense of a man who was struggling with his own sense of mission and personal identity, who, though he called Abba on the Lord as father, certainly did not presume that he was in a special way his son. He was struggling with who he was in the course of doing what he was trying to do. It wasn't about him to the extent that's about him once we get to the church's memory in the Gospel of John. For Rachel, the enactment, this beautiful enactment of the Lord's self-abasement, so to speak, so as to welcome and and touch the feet of his disciples is, a, is a, a great moment in the history of the church. I feel very uncomfortable with it. I would much rather have a chance to remember myself into what it would have been to be at that table as one could feel the sort of tensions of what was going on in Jerusalem in the Passover season, deal with the fact that Jesus' cleansing of the temple had caused such an uproar in the city try to understand what it was that he was, you know, living through at that moment when he shared that meal and sensed that things might be going badly for him in the days ahead. There's a historian in me, and I think a human being that wants to make contact with the human being who was Jesus. Sometimes then, bhakti, a sense of wanting to be a part of a religious community, and history get in the way of one another, or they seem to. They create, for me in any case, a struggle with the way in which being a part of the Christian community matters to Christians. I keep wanting actually to work through history to try to get back to the, the founding moment. Who was this guy who caused such a big stir in the religious life of mankind? I hadn't realized I would talk with you about that. It's the it's the mystery of being here at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And such an 11 o'clock I haven't seen for years. <laughs> it just sort of came out of me. But it does at least, I hope, state the problem for me. So my question this morning in the next several minutes is, what does it matter to take parallel cases from the uh, religious traditions of India, from the Hindu traditions of India? What does it mean to take that same kind of historian's interest in what actually happened and the difference and to what extent can we know what actually happened? And measuring that against what then happened on the basis of what people thought happened in a bhakti medium. What difference does it make in a Hindu bhakti setting as against the Christian one that I just described? What difference does it make to Keep your mental faculties with you and to ask questions of evidence 
that you would want to ask about other aspects of life as well. What does it mean, does it make a difference to try to understand who these great bhakti saints, let us say, or gurus, or figures of religious authority, people who really sort of mattered for their own times and afterward, what does it mean to try to engage with them, keeping your mental faculties with you, and asking the question of how do we know what we know? Recently, uh, you would have seen probably in uh, <laughs> the Indian papers, if you managed to read the Indian papers virtually over, let us say, well, you know, the electronic services of the Hindustan Times, for example, or perhaps uh, the BBC online, you would have seen that there was a wonderful event in Hyderabad, where, good, I'm seeing a nod, very good where a certain uh, Mr. Rangarajan, I believe his name was, who was the priest of a well-known temple in Hyderabad, actually carried a Dalit youth, whose name is Aditya, and he said to have had no second name, carried that young man on his shoulders into his temple, and having done so, um, participated in uh, acts of devotion there in the temple. The picture I saw showed both of them on the floor with their hands above their heads, prostrating themselves before the Lord. A Vaishnava temple, I'm almost sure. Why did he do that? I'm sure you would know, ma'am, <laughs> that he was enacting a bhakti story. He had been talking, Mr. Is it Rangarajan? I should know. Let's make sure we get his name right. Just a moment. I may. I need my other glasses for this one. And by the way, with some apologies, there. I actually gave you a handout for today. I don't know whether we'll use that handout or not, but probably we will. Uh, I just. I'm of a generation of teachers who don't believe what I what comes out of my mouth, but the handout I believe in. So <laughs> that's why it's here. <laughs> Let's see if we can recover through my other glasses. Just make sure that this man's name is Mr. Rangarajan. Aditya, I'm sure of. Rangarajan, at the Chiklur Balaji Temple in Hyderabad. Good. Why did he do that? He did it so as to reenact the story of how Tirpan Alwar made his way into the temple of Sri Rangam on an island in the Kaveri River in the south of India. I don't know whether you know this story or not. Certainly any of you who have Tamil backgrounds would know it, and probably many of the others of you as well. Tutupan was one of the alwars, that's to say those who are drenched in the Lord, whose poetry we can date back to the sixth to the ninth <coughs> centuries of the common era. Uh, there's the great story of how Tirupan, totally who was a, by the way, a, uh, a drummer actually, a musician. So by virtue of the fact that he was a drummer, one knows already that he is touching the skin of a dead animal, which marks his caste or social position in a certain way. And he would traditionally have been thought of as being Dalit or untouchable, a word that was indeed used up until not so very recently. Uh, he was so lost in the Lord, looking across the river to the temple of Sri Angam, where he could not go because of his social status, but he was so lost in the Lord uh, Ranganath that, that uh, he, he didn't realize he was in the way, that he was in the road, that he had just been overcome. But certain high caste people, they're named Brahmins in the traditional story, see him there and they cannot pass on the road until he gets out of the way because to be uh, in the presence of a Dalit would have defiled them on their way to the temple. So they throw a stone at him to sort of wake him up and to be able to pass on their way to the temple. The stone hits and you know, he comes to and, and they're able to pass. And when they arrive in the temple, they find that the murti of the Lord is bleeding in the head. Great bhakti story. So, and the Lord speaks to them, makes it clear what has happened as if they didn't know. So they go back across, they realize that uh, Tirpan Alwar is indeed a great devotee of the Lord. You know, 
a musical devotee of the Lord. Patrick, you gave us a little music this morning. Music matters in this story. A musical devotee of the Lord. They put him on their shoulders and they take him across to the temple, at which point he is encountered by the deity in murti form and merges into the deity. Please note, he has not himself, Tirpan, has not actually touched any of the temple surfaces. He has only touched the Lord. Again, he has been on the shoulders of his Brahmin Vahana, his carriers. In this modern reenactment of the Tirupan story, Aditya, who becomes Tirupan in this story, Aditya does actually touch the floor of that temple. And the language around this is very explicit that the time has passed when we can deny, when we can think of religion as the sort of thing. Purity, you know, to hell with purity. Um, that's not the kind of purity that we want to celebrate anymore. We're past the time where someone who is adjudged by society to not be of the same level of purity as we are cannot come and worship in our place. And a very important feature of the story is that they actually, one can see the pictures of the priest and the Dalit actually performing the same actions on the floor of the temple. That temple has been sacralized by the presence of this untouchable, but he's not untouchable man. And the reason that the priest undertook this was that he had been worried about and thinking about acts against Dalits, not just there, but in many parts of India that have concerned many, many Dalits and others who are concerned about social justice, and had been talking with students at one of the universities in Hyderabad, I'm not sure which one. And they had, one of them had said, do you really think that any Brahmin would carry, you know, this is just a story, that any Brahmin would carry a Dalit upon the, his shoulders into the temple? And he thought about it and decided he would do exactly that. This is a beautiful example, I would say, of a story where history really matters. Or thinking back to that moment with Tirupan, walking back into that history, but walking back in a new way so that the history comes alive in relation to issues that matter, still matter, and matter in a way today that really they matter even more, you could say, than in the past. But we can ask about that story. Is it true that there was a historic Tirupan Alwar who actually had this happen to him or not? Folks, we don't know. All we know is that that story is reported in the hagiographies that emerged in Tamil Nadu by the 12th century. Tirupan, in his own poetry, which is a part of the Alwar's poetic collections, doesn't report on or refer to such an episode at all. So we just don't know. And it has a formulaic quality. It's a beautiful story, but it does have a formulaic quality to it. Um, Nandanar, on the Shaiva side of things, also gains temple interest, but some of the same motifs are there. Uh, if you're thinking of West India, one might be thinking of... Um, of Chokamela sitting outside of the temple in Pandarpur. Again, he does not make it into the temple, and there are, there are parallel motifs all around. Uh, Ravi Das comes to mind for North India. So that question, if you're cursed with the sort of desire to know history, even if we can't know what actually happened, to want to know what actually happened, one needs to ask that historical question in this guise too. So now let me just shift to a couple of things that have, uh, with those as introductions, that have occupied me for the last some years. Um, Diane, you kindly mentioned the book that I've called A Storm of Songs, and we'll turn to that in a moment. That's a book about how we came to have the idea that there was such a thing as the Bhakti movement, which unified Indian religious history, and which is a common notion to any of you, I would say, who might have grown up in India, and to many others as well. The Bhakti movement, uh, in its simple integuments, is the idea that, uh, that Bhakti moved as a sort of wave through Indian history, beginning with the Alwars and the Nayanars, the Shaiva and Vaishnava saints of South India, composing in Tamil, and then moved up the west coast toward the north, where it uh, had as its legacy uh, well, songs that are sung in, in uh, Canada, 
Telugu, in especially Kannada is marked there, in Gujarati, in Hindi, and by the way, Bengal is not forgotten, although it's not a part of the canonical narrative uh, that we'll be talking about in just a moment. But the, story, the idea is that Bhakti moved as a sort of wave from south to north. It's a wonderful story, and it serves quite a number of functions in uh, a, histor a sort of religious narrative of what India is about. One of those functions is the one we've just been talking about. It incorporates a saint like Tirupan, who comes from an, a despised background, or his northern cousin, Ravidas, into a much larger uh, story of inclusive religiosity. Another thing that it does is build a, uh, a line between, let us say, the Gupta period, what was thought of as the classical period of Indian civilization, that early Vedic period coming to fruition in political terms in the Gupta period, uh, connects that with what was to happen when the British came. So it fills in this huge medieval gap in Indian history. And the Bhakti movement provides a way of telling that story in a way that seems to connect India to other parts of India all along, and thereby prepares the way for the emergence of uh, what ultimately would be the Indian state uh, in the middle of the 20th century, which is then felt to enact an India which had been there all along. And not because the, Brit the British created it, but because it was there, at least in a, in a sort of shared religious way um, in, in India itself. So the Bhakti movement is a, is a wonderful story. It's an inclusive story uh, that, uh, that involves the entire population as it is wanted to be told. But we have to ask the same historical question about the Bhakti movement that we have asked in the case of Tirupan and Jesus. Is it true? It certainly is true that uh, from the, this we can testify, from the 12th century onward, we have collections of stories and of poetry which are attributed to these uh, Tamil poets. There's no doubt about that. But what about the story of how things moved from the Tamil country up into the north? That proves to be much more difficult. In this book called A Storm of Songs, I've tried to follow that out by asking, when did we come to have this narrative? When do we first know the story of how bhakti moved from the south to the north? At what point in time and under what circumstances did someone build this story so that we, looking back, could understand that this is history in a basic way? That's where your handouts come in. So on the first, sorry, multiple glasses, on the first page of your handout, you'll see why I wanted to call the book A Storm of Songs. This does finally take us to Bengal. In case we're just waiting to get to Bengal, we're, we're there now. On the first page of your handout, you'll see that we have an issue of the, uh, the magazine Harijan, which emerged in the 1930s at the time when Gandhi was going on his fast against untouchability, and Harijan, of course, was Gandhi's generic way of referring to what we would call the people we would today call Dalits. Um, let's just read the poem. Ray Das, whom we may also know as Ravi Das, and you would doubtless know Ravi Das is, comes from a leather worker uh, community, lived, we can quite confidently say, in the 16th century in Banaras, and was a, a the poet of some very beautiful and moving poems. And how do we know that? Because his poems are registered in various collections in North India, but the first of them is actually the, the Kartarpur Bir, which leads forward to the Adi Granth of the Sikhs. So we have, we owe to the Sikh community, who would then separate themselves, largely speaking from Hindus, we owe to the Sikh community the creating of the anthology on which we can, on which we must always rely because we have a dated manuscript of it that uh, goes back to 1604. So at the end of the 16th century, we know that these poems were celebrated by, sung by six as they gathered around their own gurus, their own Mahabhakts, you could say. Um, so that's who we're looking back to as we look at Raidas, and it's no surprise that Tagore 
joining with Gandhi, he didn't always do so, Gandhi, joining with Gandhi on the occasion of his fast against untouchability, wanted to compose a poem in honor of Redas. So what he did was he took two of his Bengali poems and put them together so that they would form uh, a new poem. He was certainly a poet in Bengali and in English, so he, to make that translation internally, he created a new English poem. And this is what came out, so here it is. Redas, the sweeper, was tanner by caste, whose touch was shunned by the wayfarers and the crowded streets were lonely for him. Any of you who have been, who have lived in India would know that the shoemaker, the man, always a man, I think, in my experience, and not a woman, the man who will repair your shoes, is sitting in the general bazaar. A lot of traffic is going by. He's way down here. I can't, I'm too old to be able to do it myself, but yeah, his, his knees will still do it. He is on the ground, so he's at the level where he can deal with your shoes. The traffic is going by in front of him like that, but, but he's, he's there. The world passes him by, and he's there to fix people's shoes so that they too can continue to pass by. Tagore conjures up that moment. <coughs> Master Ramanand, okay, we have to stop and ask who this person is. Ramanand is remembered as a saint who grew up in the Sri Vaishnava community to which I've just been referring by alluding to the story of Tirupan Alwar. And in fact, the temple where Tirupan was, at which he was looking, that temple had as its main administrator, the great philosopher, um, Ramanujan, whom we know as a you know, philosopher of Vishishtadvaita, taking issue with Shankara and so forth. So these issues are alive and well in the Vedanta Society of New York, I know. So <laughs> Swami Ramananda is remembered as having um, disagreed with Ramanuja about per certain details about who could eat with whom and under what circumstances, <coughs> took a more radical view, and is remembered as having uh, been sort of kicked out of the temple for his uh, radical views and traveled north. And the story goes that he showed up in Banaras and other places in North India and then became the nucleus of his own community, among whom Raidas was one. So the story goes. It's one of the central stories of the Bhakti movement narrative. So that's what Tagore is calling forward for us here. Master Ramanand, he's made it to North India. He's certainly walking down the street, you know, he's the big guy. And I keep thinking that actually Tagore must have had this experience himself. He was certainly a big guy, certainly was interested in walking on the streets where many people gathered. He must have seen the shoemaker sitting at the side of the street as he traveled. Master Ramanand was walking to the temple after his morning bath when Raidas bowed himself down before him from a distance. Who are you, my friend, asked the great Brahman. And the answer came, I am mere dust dry and barren, trodden down by the despising days and nights. Thou, my master, art a cloud from far away, from, uh, art, a cl art a cloud on the far away sky. If sweet mercy be showered from thee upon the lowly earth, the dumb dust will cry out in ecstasy of flowers. It's all so, so like Tagore. Close quote. Master took him to his breast, so he touches him, took him to his breast, pouring on him his lavish love, which made a storm of songs, there's my phrase, to burst across the heart of Raidas, the sweeper. I wanted to take that metaphor, storm of songs, out of its context right there and say that the story of the bhakti movement is a story of a storm of songs. Actually, this becomes an issue. It's a monsoon issue, uh, which is engaged between a British philologist by the name of Grierson, Abraham Grierson, and uh, Hazari Prasad Devedi, one of the great scholars of Hindi literature, who was teaching at Shantiniketan, having been called there by Tagore, in the 1930s, and becomes, from my point of view, the real pivot point for the bhakti movement narrative. Um, the issue that, uh, that Hazari Pazandavedi has with Grierson is as follows. 
Gerson had published a very influential article in the Encyclopedia Britannica. That was back when encyclopedias mattered. Now we have Wikipedia, you can rewrite the story yourself. I don't mean to speak against it, I use it all the time, but it's a little different from the Britannica. To be invited to give, to author an article for the Britannica was a big deal. And indeed, the Britannica was read around the English-speaking world, including India. You know, surely Belur has, you know, has the 1910 Britannica. Um, yeah. so, there you are, okay, right. So, Grierson had written the article on Bhakti for the Britannica. And what he said there was that he used something like the Bhakti movement story, but he was always worried, Grierson, a great scholar actually, of vernacular North Indian literature. There's more we could say about him, but we're not going to. Um, a great scholar, but he kept puzzling as a Christian. He kept puzzling about, you know, how could this have happened in India? Surely the message of Christianity got to them at some point, but then he, he, he thought it was early for a while, then he thought it was later, somehow in the background of Kabir, who knows. He's always worried about how it can be that Christian bhakti and Hindu bhakti actually share so many resemblances. And he, in doing that, he used the metaphor of a strike of lightning. He thought there must have been a strike of lightning somehow that, that ignited Hindu sensibilities and made them more Christian from his point of view. That strike of lightning must have been the influence of Christianity on Hindu religious history. Hazari Prasad Devedi would have nothing of it. He said, thinking of, you know, so a strike of lightning which leads to a storm, the clouds burst and we get real bhakti. Hazari Prasad says, no, 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 you don't know how the monsoons work. These clouds have been building for years and years and years. It's not a single stroke of lightning that causes anything. It's just the cumulative effect of the building of the clouds ultimately, of course, produces the rains. So he wanted to tell a story of the continuous movement of bhakti through Indian history. That's why I've chosen this phrase. I think that, that sense of what the bhakti movement is lies behind this poem and is its plot. Swami Ramanan, representing that southern tradition, walks somewhere, meets Rai Das, who then comes on board and is allowed to sing, is, uh, is encouraged to sing because of Ramanan's presence. Beautiful poem, though it does have its hierarchies. It has its mercies, but it has its hierarchies. Many Dalits are not so fond, certainly would not want this poem to be their poem because Redas is, you know, is the aristocrat for them, not necessarily Ramanand. And we have to ask as historians, who is this Ramanand? Can we be sure that the story we hear about Ramanand is the accurate story? It turns out that only six of Ramanand's own poems survive uh, in the records that we have, so we know far less about him than we wish we did. What we do know is that the community that, and those poems give no indication of having a Tamil background at all. Frankly, I doubt it. What we do know is that at the end of the 16th century, a man by the name of Navadas put together a collection, a remarkable collection called the Bhaktamal, which tells a garland of the stories of bhaktas, of devotees. And Ramanand is one of them, not just one of them. He is the person around, his own, around whom his own monastic community has formed. So the author of that great collection of North Indian uh, stories about bhaktas is himself a Ramanandi. So for him, and they're telling the story of how Ramanand, you know, actually had this experience with Ramanuja. It's a little difficult because it would have had to have happened four centuries, five centuries earlier, but Ramanuja is still a lot, you know, kind of nearby. It's difficult. You have this whole narrative, series of narratives in the Ramanandi community about ka how Kabir and Raidas were actual pupils of Ramanand, but there's, ac but there's nothing in either the poetry of Kabir or of Raidas to suggest that they had ever heard the name Ramanand. Sorry. This is a story that was made up, I think, by Ramanandis to try to make sense of their world and gather together the songs that they actually sang around the guru whom they understood themselves to be worshiping. That's the kind of problem that we have with the bhakti movement story. Since we've mentioned Nabaji, let me also say that uh, he, 
uh, he fashioned this, the, the, the sort of the, the structural moorings for this story are what he named as the four sampradayas, the four religious teaching communities of which he belonged to one, the Ramanandis. But there are three others and he uses the ancient Vaishnava um, concept of the vyuha to describe them. Let's not go there. In any case, he builds these, these four communities then become the uh, integuments, of the, so the, the, the weight-bearing structures of the bhakti movement story. And he says they all have southern precedents his own in the case of Ramanuja, but it's also the case for all of the others. The problem is that if we look, for example, at Vishnu Swami, who is one of these four pillars, there's no, there's no way of establishing a relationship between Vishnu Swami and Vallabhachari in the north, who, was, who at a certain point claimed, was made to claim that lineage. So there are lots of problems in the story. Also, uh, Navada seems to know nothing about the Alvars. He knows the names of the Sanskrit teachers, but he doesn't know the story. So it's, you know, it's, it's not hanging together as a story. So we have to ask ourselves, under what circumstances did he invent this story? I think, I think it has to do with the Mughal Empire and its relationship to the Kachwaha throne at modern-day Jaipur or Amer at that period in time. So the, the Ramanandis have a place at Galta just across, sort of across the mountain from Jaipur and we're establishing new contacts with the throne, their local throne and also with the Mughal Empire. I think this is a Mughal story actually. And I think that Nabaji told this story because the Sufis nearby, the Sufis had a way of telling religious history that uh, depended upon the establishing of Sufi lineages so as to ground their own poetic universe in a history that would look like history. Seeing this, I think, Nabaji creates a parallel account for what we would call Hindus or for Bhaktas. So the actual political landscape in which the, the core narrative from a philosophical point of view of Bhakti emerges going back to Ramanuja and others in the south, is a story that emerges in a Mughal environment, in a cross-religious environment that was new in its time. And the empire, of course, was a new kind of empire. So this is the kinds of things that emerge if you begin looking at history. Um, my time is really close to being up, so. <laughs> well, how about five or seven minutes? I Late. Yeah, but you all didn't start late. You got here for an on-time thing, and here you are imprisoned by me. It's not so good. No. On the first, let me t try to take just seven minutes more. Um, uh, also, on the first page of your handout, we're still only on the first page, we have the other canonical story of the Bhakti movement, and this is the one that is told in a text called the Bhagavata Mahatmya, which, of course, sings the, the Mahatmya, the glory, of the Bhagavata Purana. So far we've been talking in a sort of sant milieu, Raidas and, and Ramanan and Kabir and so forth. So that's one story that emerges. It being tied, so these sants then are being anchored in the Vaishnava communities of the South by the Bhakti movement story. Meanwhile, we have the great story, which I don't know how many of you have the Bhagavata Purana sitting there at home, but if you have the Gita Press edition, you will find that the Bhagavata Mahatmya has been printed at the first of that edition and you read onward from there. So here's the great story of Bhakti as told in the Bhagavata Mahatmya, which is singing the glories of the Bhagavata Purana, the great Vaishnava text. Utpanada re saham vrintim karnataka gata, kwachit kwachin maharashtra gurjare jirnatan gata. Tatra Gora Kare Yogat and so forth. It really gets bad at that point. But the good part is Brindavanam punha prapya navineva swarupini jataham yavati samyak preshtarupata sampratam. So here is Bhakti herself, imagined as a woman, speaking to the sage Narada, who says, Who are you? And how come you're so gorgeous? And he says, So she tells this story. She's gorgeous because she's been reborn in, in Brindavan. But where did she come from? The south. She came from the south. And she traveled along the western coast up through Gujarat where she had some problems, 
the Gujaratis don't like this story. <laughs> to go through Gujarat, then finally she gets to Vrindavan. <gasps> She's much better. And the story goes on that she goes on to Haridwar, but that part isn't usually told. In any case, when, by the time she gets to Vrindavan, she's gorgeous again. And, uh, and what is that speaking about historically? It surely has to do with the building of Vrindavan in the 16th century with the sponsorship of who? Exactly those people we were just talking about, the Kachwahas of Amer, later Jaipur, and the Mughal state. That is when Vrindavan came to be built. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is remembered as he certainly went there, but the institutions that were created there, which had a debt to Chaitanya, happened under the orbit of the Mughal state. So the story actually fits together. Now we have to ask ourselves, where does this account come from that is singing the glories of the Bhagavata? How far back in time does it go? Where do we meet it? We know there's this text, the Bhagavata Mahatmya. How old are the manuscripts? Manuscripts. Manuscripts, that's where, the, that's where the stuff of this is. The earliest manuscript that I've been able to find, thanks to the great catalogus catalogorum of Chennai, is dated to 1714, the early 18th century. And there's a whole cluster of manuscripts of the Bhagavata Mahatmya that emerge at that point in time beginning of the 18th century. Why would such a text have been written then? Not much earlier, not in the, hello, not in, no, not in the time that's being described, but in the early 18th century, why? I think because the author of this text was trying to speak, he was trying to recapture for his community of Brahmins the recitation of the Bhagavata Purana. Don't listen to other people's stories about the Bhagavata. Don't listen to what those Kayasts are saying. Don't listen to the translations that are emerging in Hindi. We have this tale. We are Brahmins. We have a southern background. So I think it's out of a desire to shore up the position of his own community as a community which had southern roots in some way, or at least for whom southern roots were being claimed, that we get the story of how the Bhagavata itself emerged and bhakti as a sort of movement through Indian history. But it's an 18th century story. It's not the historical truth. It may build on certain elements, but it leaves out some other elements. That's what that's doing on your handout. Now we can go quickly. Once you get to page two, you have several versions of the bhakti movement narrative. I won't go through it for you. Two maps from the, my book, The Storm of Songs. One will have some nice familiar names to you. We'll, you ought to be able to find Tirupan there. You'll certainly find Ravidas or Redas. And I hope some other favorites of yours as well. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, Shankaradeva even farther east, Laldeid way up there in the north. And even some Muslim names occur from the region of Sindh. And indeed, moving to page three of your handout, there are some wonderful things about the story that suggest that it really was a movement. Take a look at the poem which is attributed to Basava or Basavanna, 12th century probably writing in Kannada. This is translated by A.K. Ramanujan. Milk is left over from the calves, water is left over from the fishes, flowers from the bees. How can I worship you, O Shiva, with such awful? It's not for me to despise leftovers, so take what comes, Lord of the Meeting Rivers. Basava, probably 12th century. Uh, okay, so it's, it's easy. You can see that this same poem about the limits of ritual is repeated in Na by Namdev and later by Raidas himself. And I give you a contemporary Gujarati version I was talking with a man by the name of Niranjan Guru about this, this song. He said, oh yes, of course, we have that, but it's a different version of it. It's dedicated to the Lord Ganesh. Okay. It seems clear from this narrative of this poem that this is a bhakti movement narrative. The poem emerges in Kannada and then is carried up the west coast by Namdev to the north, Raidas, and boom, they know of it in Gujarat too, despite what they say about Gujarat in the bhakti movement narrative. It's a very happy story. Enter the historian. How old are the manuscripts? Do we really know that this is the story of how this poem, you know, burst like a storm across India? Alas, it's not as simple as that. Our earliest manuscripts for Basava come from the 15th century, not from the 12th. 
And at the current state of knowledge, I cannot tell whether this poem is actually represented among those that emerged in the 15th century. But please remember that the, our earliest manuscript for Ravidas comes at the end of the 16th, just about the same period of time. So there's no way of knowing, really, which of these poems came first and which came later. The Namdev manuscripts are even later. So it's a mess. We just have to ask, well, how did this poem, which is more than one poem, but it clearly is the same poem, how did it get into these various Indian languages? Folks, we don't know. We don't know whether that maps onto the Bhakti movement story or not. We don't know the history of it. All we know is that someone who was speaking Hindi, let us say, could also be heard by someone who spoke Marathi. Or maybe it was the other way around. And that the Marathi and the Kannada, which are quite close to each other, they too heard each other, but we don't know exactly how it happened. So I've tended to think of the bhakti movement not as a movement so much, but as a network that somehow ties all of India together, and we don't actually know what the history of bhakti there might be. What's on the back? I'm gonna, it turns out to be another lecture. We're not gonna get to it today. Suppose we were to take, not Tirupan, but someone from North India about whom I know a little more, Mirabai, and ask, what do we know? So remember my Jesus problem with the Gospel of John? Suppose I'm listening to a, you know, a Mira Bhajan. Mere to dusuro na Suppose I listen to that, and I have in mind the Mira Bhai who sang that. Enter the historian. Okay, let's go to the manuscripts. Let's try to find this poem in the manuscripts. I have sad news for you. It does not appear in manuscripts before the 20th century. Now, maybe it was, has been sung for a very long time, or maybe it became popular much later than the life of Mirabai herself. Clearly 16th century. This we know, once again, because of the six, uh, both on a, and she also appears in, the, in Navadasa's Abhaktamal. So we know that she was known. But there's only one Mirabai poem that we can firmly date to the 16th century, and it is hardly this one. It's the one that you have on the last page of your handout, and I'll bet you've never seen it before. It's the one that appears in the Guru Granth Sahib of the Sikhs, or rather, once again, the Fatehpur, the, sorry, the Katarpur Bir. And um, it's noticeable, it's notable that Merito Giritar Gopal, Dusro Nako Giritar Gopal. You know, we do have here the mountain lifter, but there's none of the Mirabai story that we expect to be so important in her poetry. And in fact, all the way through the 17th century, we, that story of how, you know, she carries her childhood murti of Krishna into her wedding ceremony and so forth, the story you know so well. There's nothing about that story that shows up in poetry attributed to her up to the end of the 17th century. I'm not sure when it comes in. So these questions, I don't know how a, a devotee of Mirabai would react to the fact that we actually have only one poem of hers from the 16th century. The rest gathers around her, apparently, in the course of time. What do we make of that? How do we take our sort of Gospel of John viewpoint and say, well, but this is what the community feels she stood for. Okay, but that doesn't mean that that's who she was. And in fact, the stories about her, but this is another talk, diverge widely from one another. There's a hilarious one that the Sikhs tell in the period of Guru Gobind Singh, where her in-laws don't even figure. Um, there are other stories where told by, um, by Dalits, actually, by Dalit singers about Mirabai, where the most important thing is that she will not bend to the will of the Rana, who comes out against her. But in the Sikh version, these latter Sikh versions, the Rana doesn't even appear. And then there's the whole debate about what she did when she left Mewar. Did she go to Brindavan to meet Jeev Goswami? That's the story we all know although it's sometimes told as Rupa Goswami, where she's, you know, he won't meet with her because he's 
you know, he's not talking with women, he's a, he's a sadhu. And he says, geez, I thought there was only one man in town. You know, I came to see him, not you anyway, so never mind. You know, so that's the story we all know. But the competing story is that she became a devotee of Ravidas himself. And who tells that story? It's not the story that's told in the commentary on the Bhaktamal, no. It's a story that first emerges in the Santa literature with which the, the Adigrant of the, the, uh, of the six is closely connected. So we have two different storylines about who Mirabai's guru was. Is it the Saguna Krishna represented by Jeev Goswami and so forth? Or it is the Nirguna, is it even Krishna? represented by Raidas. Some of these old poems, Mirabai addresses herself to Ram, not to Krishna. So, in conclusion, no conclusion. <laughs> Bhakti makes you think. If you, you know, if you have this historical bone in your body, then it, all I can say for myself is that, and I only can speak for myself, and this sets me a, a little apart from Rachel. I'm not, she's not here to defend herself. Um, for me, the, I, I want to believe that the, the task of asking the historical question, because I am a historical being like I think everybody in the room, the task of asking the historical question and bringing your full faculties to the table as you think about felt religious history and music even, I feel it just has to matter somehow that we are able to do those things in a single brain and don't need to think of our musical selves as being different from our rational selves. Somehow it all has to come together. It doesn't mean that I know who Jesus was. All I know is that is what we have from the records and how it appealed to different communities of people over the course of time. And I can take my place in that lineage as a, as a Christian. Similarly, as a Hindu, you could argue I'm more Hindu than Christian, actually. I can take my place in the lineage of saints like Raidas and Mirabai, but, but I hope it's productive to realize that the Raidas who comes to us today, and especially the Mirabai who comes to us today, is a product of a history of engagement on the part of more recent centuries than their own. Somehow to take your place in that story, to realize you, you know, that it's a decision of your own to take your place in that story, that's an important decision. So our priest, Mr. Rangarajan in Hyderabad, I believe he was doing that. He was taking seriously for himself and for his community what the larger import of the Bhakti movement story told him about what the Tirupan story meant. It may not have had foundations in the actual world of Tirupan in the ninth century, it may not have done, but the story came along by the 12th century and the story mattered. He was in the position of making history with that story this week. That to me, is the fruit of the bhakti movement. Thank you so much.